Hey, hello, how are you? This is a show for everyone else. Instead of going after top 1% of the world, we dedicate this podcast to celebrate the lives of the unsung heroes and self-made artists. Well, we try to a little bit to create a zero waste lifestyle. I want people to feel comfortable, but still modern and cool. If I have to do something and before I get kids, before I get too settled down, it has to be now. And also I didn't be, wanted to be within that field I was in anymore. I enjoyed it for the time that I had and I got to travel and all that. But I was like, if I have to do it, it has to be now. And I'm um, so happy I did it. I gave it 110% all the way. I had like all the internships that I could have to learn the most possible. Um, it was just all about school, all about making the perfect uh, result in whatever I was doing and learning as much as possible. In the beginning, it was very, very much uphill and um, you spend a lot of money uh, figuring out what not to do. You see a company come and then after two years, it's totally gone. It's because people want to do it too fast. Like you have to go steady, you have to go organically. Hi there, this is Fei Wu and you're listening to The Face World Podcast. I'm excited today, as I'm saying this about every single guest, but come on, we have a fashion designer on the show today. If you know me or followed me on Instagram or on social media, you probably noticed that I'm pretty big into fashion. I love it. I love shopping, purchasing clothes, assembling new outfits, advising my friends all about it. Um, but Malaika really taught me a lot of things. She is a sustainable fashion designer and founder for Malaika New York, which I absolutely adore. Setting foot in her store in New York, I was immediately drawn to the fabrics and the designs of each of the pieces labeled Malaika before I realized the concept of such design called zero waste. By implementing zero waste patterns, Malaika is able to strategically drape the fabric in such a way that so little to no materials are wasted. I had to do some research on this topic since so many people, especially young millennials, are becoming more and more conscious. So I found out that more than 15 million tons of used textile waste is generated each year in the United States. And the amount has doubled over the last 20 years. I'm a fan of Burberry, but I found out in early July 2018, they burned almost 40 million of their stocks and caused outrage on the internet. The company admitted destroying the unsold clothes, accessories, and perfume instead of selling it off cheaply in order to protect the brand's exclusivity and value. Originally from Denmark, Malaika had learned about recycling and saving energy at a very young age. She didn't pursue fashion design right away after graduating from college. Instead, she spent a number of years working in a different field before she decided to apply to not just any fashion school, but Parsons in New York. Parsons is one of the best fashion design schools in the world. She knew the competition, but you won't get in if you don't try, right? So she got in, worked very hard for her degree, and today she has a brand she created and loves. You may be wondering, there's so many brands out there. The competition is unimaginable. Fast fashion brands such as Zara, H&M will turn around new collection in less than two weeks. Like Seth Godin has taught me, we need to appeal to the smallest possible audience, speak to them, write for them, and in Malika's case, create something so special for them. Let me tell you a few more things about the brand. Malika create garments using a very special textile, which is a regenerated and high quality material made from fishing net, old carpets, and other nylon waste. Using one of their bestsellers called the Swatch Jacket, 
The jacket is created with plastic bag embellishments, and the fabric is made from 100% upcycled scraps from their past collections. Another concept I absolutely agree with, which is seasonless collection. Their designs are free from qualifications of traditionally seasoned garments. Genderless. The entire collection of Malaika is genderless, producing a collection free from constraints of gendered pieces. So I think that's a lot of information we typically don't provide for a brand for, or for a guest, but I really want to surface some of these topics because they're just so interesting. And therefore, I would love to welcome your feedback, such as what you'll learn from this episode and maybe something that you could teach us about um, the fashion industry or how it may help inform our decisions about making choices for our new purchases moving forward. Without further ado, please welcome the creator and founder of Malaika New York, Malaika Haining to the Face World podcast. I want to tell you the way I discover your brand. For my listeners, whenever people ask me what I would do for my life if I didn't turn out to be a marketer or if I didn't study computer science, I've always said I would absolutely love to study fashion. So I'm so glad to have you, Malika, graduated from not only Parsons, but also uh, now a brand that I'm watching very, very closely because I love every single piece from it. And <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Could you tell us a little bit about your origin story? Maybe, you know, how you got into fashion, how you figured out like, oh, that maybe is something I really want to do. It was actually pretty early on. Um, I guess I was always uh, encouraged to use my name for something because my like isn't a typical Danish name either. I guess at first I wanted to be a singer. Like I gave that up very, very early on. <laughs> Um, and then I was like, okay, what should I do then? And, you know, I always like to dressing up and coming up with these, I mean, all kids draw, I obviously, but I started drawing like, of course, dresses, uh, cause it's something that's easy to do, but also coming up with like, uh, unconventional materials. Um, and then just starting playing around with basically stretch fabric and, and then sewing them into tubes. And then, you know, different sizes and then just trying to play with it on the body kind of thing. How, how old were you at the time? Do you, re- do you remember? Eight or nine or something like that. That's, wow. a, that's very early on. I mean, it was not like said I wanted to be a fashion designer. It was just more like, you know, being a kid and playing. Mm-hmm. And then I guess it just continued growing with me. And for New Year's 2000, uh, the millennium, and I was like, okay, I need to do something big. I wanted to do something like big silver dresser, you know, something that's like welcoming it into a new decade. And uh, I made this silver dress. And for New Year's in Denmark, anyway, you go around and you visit all neighbors and friends and during the evening. And I was wearing the outfit and everyone was complimenting me. Of course, it's very different. So I don't know if it was like, oh, this is, you know, pretty or this is just different. I don't know, but I had a fun night and I'm like, okay, maybe I should try and work more towards something in this direction. Wow. So you attended, so kind of bring from that memory to going to school at Parsons certainly wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't unplanned because for, for most people listening to the show, except for maybe people who don't live in the US, most Americans know that Parsons and, and FIT, you know, these are the top, not only the top fashion design schools in the U.S., but they are known worldwide. Um, So what was that application process like? And and I don't know at what age you uh, moved to the U.S. Yeah, so my story getting to Parsons is very long. Um, But to make it short, I guess um, I worked uh, professionally in actually logistics uh, for 10 years traveling. Uh, That's how I came to the U.S. in the beginning. And um, they just sent me around the world. There was no way. And then I guess back in uh, the States, a couple of places. And I just eventually found out it wasn't for me. And I was like, okay, um, I was project one way. I guess that's how I more I learned about persons in the first place. And then I read about it and also read about FIT and like 
figuring out where to go. But then I was like, okay, Parsons is the school. It's like Harvard for uh, within fashion. And I thought, okay, if I really want to do this, uh, you know, at an older age compared to the kids that goes back to or goes to college, I was like, okay, I need to be in a lead school and I want to learn fast and I want to get going. And then I was like, okay, let's try to apply for Parsons. And I'm like, okay, I was probably like 5% I would get in because it's a very tough school to get into. Mm-hmm. And um, I guess a couple of months later, I got a letter that I was accepted. I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm moving to New York kind of thing. Because wow. I was living in New York at that time, yeah. Oh, wow. So this yeah. is actually interesting because a lot of our guests who appear on the show uh, talk about the unconventional route or kind of the unexpected nature of life that just happened. So I, what I heard was you worked in logistics, so some like a different industry altogether. Yeah. And that's when you realize, may I ask, you know, around what age you were at the time? With, were you in your late, mid to late 20s? You know, uh, Late 20s, yeah. Wow. And then you said to yourself, okay, I've already gone to school, but now I'm willing to, in a way, sacrifice uh, you know, a route where I'm already getting paid, I have a salary, but um, I want to pursue fashion design. What were you thinking at the time? Like, what was going through your head? Well, it's like, you know, late 20s, that's about where people start getting kids and all that. Um, and I was like, if I have to do something and before I get kids, before I get too settled down, it has to be now. And also I didn't be, wanted to be within that field I was in anymore. I would enjoyed it for the time that I had and I got to travel and all of that. But I was like, you know, if I have to do it, it has to be now. And I'm so happy I did it. Wow. I I love how determined you are. And I knew I wanted to do it and I did it. Um, So, you know, we, in my opinion, I've had huge respect uh, for Parsons and FIT and I have friends who attended there and I'm wearing a lot of clothes from from uh, people who have gone to school, I mean, as much as I could afford, uh, a lot, Alexander Wang, uh, Philip Lim, all these people graduated and many more graduated from these schools. What was it like for you to be in your late 20s, not just attending a general business school, you know, but a very technical design school where I I don't know, what is that like? Well, you know, how old were the other people? I mean, were they caddy difficult to work with (laughs) um so the degree that i took is a two-year degree uh at parsons and it's for people who already have other degrees in other fields like logistics business uh, even people that uh, educated themselves to be lawyers and all that uh i went to school with those people and all of those people also know that at one point of their life they have to make a decision to what they're going to do in the future and this is kind of, it was kind of the, like the last thing for them, but they, most of them had actually been studying before. Only a few had work experiences. And I feel like the ones that had work experience before were, I would say, almost a better student uh, because they knew how, what they were going to use their education for, where the others have just been studying. Okay, this is just another education. So, you know, I don't know, maybe I want to do this. And for me, it was like, no, this is it. I moved to New York. Uh, this is Parsons. I'm so excited. Basically, you know, I gave it 110% all the way. I had like all the internships that I could have to learn the most possible. I basically didn't have a life while I was going there. Um, it was just all about school, all about making the perfect uh, result in whatever I was doing and learning as much as possible. What are some of the in- uh, internships that you had and what did you learn while you were there? Um, well, I had six total in the two years, so I didn't have a moment off, even when it was, you know, summer break, I was working at those places. Um, I had one at Michael Kors and then I had one at Guess Inc. in LA. I mean, it's different when you learn because it's different things that you're doing there. But I would say the one at Guess Inc., I was, uh, actually moved to LA for the summer to work there, uh, for three months, like a, you know, like any regular job within fashion. And I really got to see firsthand how it is that a, a big corporation works and the assignment you will get if you were hired as a designer. And um, 
I guess the same thing for Michael Kors, but it was uh, just three times a week. So it's not like a full-time job. And of course you get to see many things, but you don't get to see everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess in bigger companies like that, you only get to like design um, if you're a designer. And then of course you overlook like uh, samples and make corrections and all the stuff that come with that. Uh, And then, you know, they have uh, departments for production and sales and so on and so on and so on. What are uh, some things, you know, one or two things that come to mind that you have learned during the internships that apply so much to starting your own business, you know, your your own line of clothing from, from that time? Well, I would say, because both of them are um, fast fashion companies, Mm -hmm. one more than the other but uh, you know also within the one company you still have uh that part to it too um I would say for me wanting to start my own is of course I'm not nobody is controlling what I design like for the purchasing department they don't have a say about the designs that comes out because everything is determined but basically by them you can design uh, uh, you know many things but in the end, it's the purchasing department that's going to decide what goes out to the stores. But also the the thing for me that uh, resonated the most was the waste parts of, of everything and like the way that they come up with new styles. Um, and basically, you know, of course, looking at runway shows and all that and taking elements for every, you know, part here and there. But I mean, it's, it's just, you know, they're producing it overseas and then they get samples back and then another sample and another sample and another sample and then all the fabric samples that they go through. And I mean, it's just a lot of waste. Mm-hmm. Before we talk about Malaika, which is your brand and it's very, I think it's MalaikaNewYork.com. It's very searchable. I, I heard about the senior project. I know you went to a, a sort of a two-year school, but... Upon graduation, do you have to present a line of clothing or a piece of clothing as part of graduation, like a project or? Yeah, there is. So you have like a small collection that you do, but you have all courses, uh, like classes that you finish. And for each class, you have like an assignment. And most of my classes was construction because I was very focused on that because I believe as a fashion designer that, again, with the waste part, you know, that's what you create is you know, the final product. And, um, but for my, my last one that I actually made, uh, I came up with a textile made out of plastic bags, upcycled plastic bags. Wow. And I mean, it took, I would say at least a month to develop it, uh, to figure out like, you know, the layers and like, yeah, different ways to treat the material to, to become something you could use. Wow. I, the the reason why I asked that, I wonder if there is a connection or bridge over to the brand that you're creating because... Yeah, there is. Um, but that, so that was actually what I was trying to uh, get into the zero waste class. I, I never really heard about zero waste uh, within fashion and um, our construction teacher, um, she said that we had an assignment to create something out of a piece of fabric without cutting too much, with no sewing. And like, so she was like, you know, how can you do that? And we did that. I guess that was the zero vest that is one of our backbones. And that's also the reason why I started the company um, because I felt like I had something there. And um, I wore that particular garment that I made in that class to a store in LA I was actually just going there to get some inspiration um, for a new collection that I was creating. And the guy, I got in the door and the guy was like, stop, what are you wearing? <laughs> and I'm like, um, well, this is by me. Cause I, you know, I didn't have a company. I didn't, I had a thought, I thought about, I might have a company someday, but not, you know, that soon he's like, okay, so how many can I get? What colors do you have? And when, so, how soon can I get it? <laughs> Okay, well, let me get back to you. Let me get your email address. And because I was in LA at that point and I was actually finishing up the internship that I had. And then I was going back to New York. And I, so when he said that, I'm like, okay, I probably should 
come up with some kind of a company. <laughs> so I, <actually laughs> I love that. It to him. Yeah, the um, client first, <laughs> the company second. <laughs> um, so I founded or, you know, founded the company, I guess. Uh, back in 2014, not founded, I mean, made it official. And then I launched it in 2016. But I, sh I guess I shipped it out before I even launched the company, just as long as I could, you know, have a company number, I uh, I shipped it to him. That's smart. How many did you actually, how, how quickly did you, you had to make many because you may be wearing the only piece at the time, right? Well, I didn't. So when I got back home to New York, I started, you know, I had this raw raw you know piece so it's like okay i need to make the pattern i didn't even have a pattern i need to make the pattern and i need to make some kind of a sleeve hole because it was basically just cut out very raw with the scissor like a, it was the piece that i was working on in class and then i came out with a little bit of different placement of the snaps and i mean it took me quite a while because i was like i wanted this to be 100 percent perfect I guess I, I came back at the right time and they ordered, I think they just ordered like six in the beginning just to see if it was something that would sell. I, I guess that's how I started out. And then uh, in 2016 on um, Thursday, April, I launched the company because I thought it would be the perfect day to do that. This is Fei Wu, your host for the Face World podcast. Today, I'm chatting with Malaika Haining, founder for a zero waste fashion brand called Malaika New York. She designs garments using zero waste patterns, which strategically drapes the fabrics in such a way that so little to no materials are wasted. How do you go about cutting the material so that it's, um, you know, I, I think people who are not as into fashion or follow fashion religiously, how do you define zero waste and how do you go about cutting the materials to eliminate waste? Yeah, yeah. So for a standard piece of garment um, that anyone wear, like uh, a t-shirt, that, that has, for every t-shirt you cut out, you throw 30% of that into the dress directly. So it doesn't matter of what it's made of. It's still 30% waste is quite a lot uh, for just one t-shirt. Um, so for zero waste, um, that is when you cut, when you, well, for me anyway, because it's a little bit different from designer to designer. I work mostly with squares and rectangles. And this one has a little bit more of an organic shape, but it's still one piece. And it has less waste because instead of cutting away the fabric, I use the snaps. Oh, wow. That's where the snaps came in. Yes. So like, so it's, I was trying to figure out a way to not cut it, but still shape it to the body. Wow. And that's how the snaps came in. And like that creates a very natural drape or the drapery feel, which is something that I absolutely love. And it's so natural, not to mention to the ladies or whoever's listening, it's really flattering on you. So instead of a piece of clothing that hugs your body exactly, but it's very nicely fitted clothes, I find the additional fabrics without cutting them um, actually hide some of the imperfections. Exactly. That's also what I was trying to, to go for. Um, so if you have a little bit of muffin tops or if you just had a baby or if you've been eating too much or... Or, I mean, not even that, but also I like it as a cover-up. Uh, if you go in the city and it's really hot, you're, like, you're wearing a top and a short short. It's sometimes nice when you're in the subway or you go inside or something to have a cover-up. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a very much weatherproof. I think your brand, having launched in New York, uh, again, New York's not the only city that happens to be windy and rainy. And when I saw your line, I was thinking, wow... There's not very much clothes that's really made for that weather, but I could absolutely see that it's worth the investment because it's so versatile, not only in a style, but also in the weather conditions in many parts of the world. Yeah, for sure. And also, the you know, what we have created does not exist anywhere else. You can't. Uh, it is one of a kind. Uh, I mean, we are a small brand, so there's not many out there. Of course, it is our absolute bestseller and we sold a lot of them. 
but it's not something you're going to see for any other brand because it's simply too hard to copy. It's too time consuming. And I guess that's why not that many designers are zero waste designers because it doesn't go into standard production. So what's difficult about the process you've chosen? And that's part of, I think it's important to call that out in terms of the price range. And it's certainly not the cheapest clothing you could get. And there are there's so many different brands. You, I think about the clothes you can literally get for free. Clothes are getting cheaper and cheaper almost every year. Um, well, so I want to explore what's difficult about the process. Could you, pe- could you give people sort of an insider look behind the scenes of what goes into production, where that's all happening? Yeah. So for zero waste, or at least the piece, some of the pieces, not all of them, but some of the pieces that we create, it's basically engineering. It's like architecture. It's like molding a dough every time you make a piece. Um, and so, for example, like we, when you work with a square and you have these snaps, you have to put numbers in order for it to be correctly uh, when you put it together. So that's a big challenge uh, for sure. Um, and also the armholes, it's not normally in, in, in production, you have uh, two patterns you put together to make an armhole. Here, we just have one pattern. So you cut it around, which is not uh, an easy thing to do. And it's time consuming because in factories, they have these laser machines and they cannot cut that out. So they have to many times to be by hand. Oh, wow. So everything that we do is by hand where, where, well, I mean, of course we use a sewing machine when we sew it together, but um, that's one of the reasons why. And also we source our products uh, locally and if not locally uh, from Italy, which have very high standards. And um, so that's also a factor. And of course it's fair labor all around, which is also costly, um, but there are so many more things that goes into it than just, you know, shipping or getting something sourced in, in China and get it made there and then shipping it over here because uh, labor prices and um, cheaper yeah. cheaper and fa- effect, uh, fabric and so on. Mm-hmm. That's really fascinating. You know, I, I know there's a huge difference between going to school and really enjoy the first a few business engagement, you're excited, you're a young woman, you're building a brand and I'm sure your parents and your siblings are so proud of you. Um, And then there's the other of just being in the trenches because there's so much competition in fashion. You know, how do you overcome sort of the internal dialogue or overcome challenge and difficulties in general because you've chosen the hard path of producing fewer pieces, the process is more difficult, you know, when, when it becomes difficult, what do you, what do you do to encourage yourself to keep moving forward? (laughs) Uh, Good question. Um, in the beginning, it was very, very much uphill and, um, you spend a lot of money, uh, figuring out what not to do. (laughs) I guess I came through it because then you have light point, like, light uh, points where people like compliment your clothes like you just did that's basically you know my my high high points um and i guess i just uh i just hunger down and keep going and um most important thing because actually most fashion business they fail within a year and most of them like again two years you see a company come and then after two years it's totally gone it's because people want to do it too fast. Like you have to go steady. You have to go organically. Like every time people are like, oh, you don't want to go into Barney's. You don't want to, you know, go into big chains. I'm like, no, I'd rather not. I would rather grow organically. I want to be as direct to the customers as I can. I, I want to know what the customers are saying so that I can make the right products because in the end, it's all about you guys. It's not about what I want to create. Of course it is, but I have to adjust and figure out what to offer. I, yeah. I mean, the, it's, a, it's a challenge all the creators and marketers face. So could you tell us a bit about who is your customer base? Like, What have you noticed among the people who purchase from you? Do you have any data... And I know that people walk into the store of yours as well. So what are they like? 
they are all so very different. Um, different cultures, different ages. I would say probably most of my customers are between 35 and 45. But I also do have customers between 50 and 65. So, you know, it's just a, a large range. But um, for for the people that's younger than that, uh, they see the design first and like interested, like, who is this? And then the salespeople start talking about, you know, our sustainability, what we're trying to do. And, you know, and then I guess like you more or less fall in love with the brand and want to know even more. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so, you know, it's definitely mostly women, uh, that we have because our pieces are unisex, but, um, yeah, so I guess it's like, I got a compliment for this woman that was shopping and she had two kids. Uh, I, I feel like she had a fantastic body. Um, but she was like, your clothing just make me feel so confident because you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm hidden Mm -hmm. and I still feel sexy. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's what I'm trying to do. I want people to feel comfortable, but yeah, still modern and cool. Like some of the pieces, like if you're wearing pajamas and you put on the zero vest, I mean, go at it. Yeah, <laughs> go yeah. Out the door. People the materials. Know. See if you can talk about the material uh, briefly, because I'm fascinated by the material that you're using, you have sourced. And I try to even understand the word, but I know to me it's a general word. I, I, I try to find like, oh, I see if I have anything like that in the closet, not even close. So like, how did you find it? Like, um, I guess the first time I found something similar was through an internship. But secondly, I found it in the garment district. A similar thing, not 100% the same thing. It was a little heavier, but I'm actually happy with what I found. And so that's the fabric that I'm using now. It comes from Korea, actually. That's where they source it from. So it's very high tech. It's very uh, well engineered. Um, So like if you spill some water on it, it will lay on top a little bit. If you just press it away, it won't um, get wet and like that. Wow. What it um what is it called? I, I was trying to I'm it's on the called, website. Yeah, so it's scuba. So it's basically a fashion uh diving suit. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, but if people were listening to this, I'm gonna check out the clothes and um what would you recommend that people consider purchasing first? Uh obviously everybody's needs are different, but what do you consider as an the staples within your staples at Malaika? Um, I've been talking so much about the vest because it's so versatile and you can use it with anything. Um, but we also have the, uh, it's called hexagon t-shirt. So it's based on a hexagon. So uh, you can wear it up, uh, take the sleeves up. If it's hot outside, just one sleeve or have both down or um, it's very versatile and it's very, very soft. It, it's very airy. I almost wear it every day. And then, of course, the, the T-shirt dress as well, which I'm actually wearing right now, is also, you know, good for right now. But I guess when we get later, it will be, you know, a little colder. And, of course, for dresses, you could get the dress, uh, the zero dress, uh, because it can also be a top. So if you want to have a dress, just close all the buttons. If you want to have a top, just wear a pair of leggings. And then we just have, uh, we just got the uh, bike tube jacket out of our site. I don't know if you've seen it. Seen it. Yeah. But that one is uh, made out of bike tubes. Wow. Actually so, made out of bike tubes. Actual bike tubes. It's upcycled. Uh, we picked it up for several months, uh, all the bike tubes. And um, we have actually on our Instagram stories, you can go in there and, and check it out. But we have how everything is processed, like everything from like, picking it up to cutting them up to cleaning them to sewing them together and now there's coming videos again where we're cutting out the patterns which can only be done one by one by one so we're using this instead of a leather so it's your traditional biker jacket but it's made out of bike tubes yeah (laughs) that's amazing This is Fei Wu, your host for the Face World podcast. Today, I'm chatting with Malaika Haining, founder for a zero-waste fashion brand called Malaika New York. 
She designs garments using zero waste patterns, which strategically drapes the fabrics in such a way that so little to no materials are wasted. I was thinking this is a very unique business model. Now, because these pieces are very much staples, and then they're really good quality. The materials themselves don't deteriorate very easily. No, they're they're supposed to be for a very long time, several years, yes. Yeah, I I think, I'm even thinking at least, could if you take good care of them, I think they will very likely last longer, both uh, quality as well as style. So when you design, when you create a brand like this, which is so opposite, like the antichrist of fast fashion, you, you went the other way. Meaning, you know, listeners might not even be thinking about this, but that means you probably won't sell as many pieces and but the returning customers may be less because you're not generating 15 new designs every day. <laughs> You know, I know Zara and H&M will turn around design hundreds and thousands of designs, you know, every two weeks, every week. Um, so how do you approach that? How do you make sure that the, the brand is, stays afloat, their new revenue streams, or how, do, how does it become like me word of mouth so that if Faye, if I purchase a, a piece of clothing, I will want to spread the word so others will also buy their first pieces. Like how does that work? Well, we try to a little bit to create a zero waste lifestyle. If you follow us on social media to, you know, be a part of our family, because we want everyone that is our customers and everyone that just likes to follow us just to be a part of our family. Um, and of course, yes, we do have new pieces now and then. And as, and as you say, they are, I mean, you can probably buy five tops in H&M, but those five tops will last probably not even as long as just one of our items. So the way you should look at it is that spend a little bit more that lasts maybe 10, 20 years instead of just spending, you know, the same amount, but on five pieces from H&M that lasts, I don't know, half a year. Um, So what we're trying to do is make very good quality items that last for many years. And, you know, we don't want, what we're trying to not to do is to waste, put things out in, in the environment. When it comes to style, I, I'm curious. When it comes to zero waste, uh, minimalism, you know, do you think that your origin maybe has had an impact on the style? Uh, and, and what has been your personal styles? Like you wear a lot of your clothes and then what do you consume or purchase outside of your own brand? Uh, actually, in, in Denmark right now, and I feel like it's been for some years, it's very romantic. Some of the designs, there's a lot of florals, there's a lot of eye fabrics and all this uh, kind um, where I feel that maybe even my style is a little bit more like Japanese. For me personally, yes, I'm a minimalist, um, but I'm also a town boy actually. And I guess that's, you know, why I try to do the unisex because I feel like I don't, I don't like, um, you know, two pieces that's too tight to the body. I want everyone to feel comfortable. And I guess, um, just now that we're talking about my roots in Denmark and all of this, it has been a very big influence for me to go the way I went with um, my company because of, you know, I grew up with like saving on the water or like uh, recycling and think about like what you eat and all this kind of stuff. Um, I guess the minimal lifestyle. So my designs are very minimal, but yet they have a twist with some architectural feature in them. Mm. I wonder, as a fashion designer, uh, how many pieces of clothing do you think you you have? I mean, not precisely how many pieces, but you know, what are you happy with? You know, how many pairs of jeans? How many shirts in general uh, are you comfortable with? I'm so curious. I know I have too much and I'm trying to <laughs> minimize very slowly. So actually I have not bought new clothing since almost since I started my own brand. I just kept what I had before. And of course, if it was worn out, I had to do something with it. But for me, I, I wear my own collection most of the time. So I guess I built my collection around what I see I would use the most, like staple garments, like uh, you need the, the little black dress, you need something that you can wear with everything with the vest. 
you need a pair of leggings because leggings you use for, you know, in the winter at least, always. And I love leather, but I go on the vegan way to do a fake leather and then some comfort on the back with the organic cotton. And then, you know, what else do I have? So, yeah, so we're coming out with some new uh, winter coats as well. Uh, yeah, so I guess I don't have that much. Actually, my husband, he has more clothes in his closet than I have in mine. <laughs> well, check that out. That's Do you, you really need- don't need that many. You need something, you know, you look good in and you, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's true. When I was forced to keep to bring only one luggage to travel in Europe for three weeks, uh, I really struggled to pack in a single luggage. And it was a pretty big luggage, standard. But then I realized after three weeks of how little stuff we actually need, because along the way, I, you know, I didn't purchase anything and I've thrown away a lot of things. When you walk around town getting coffee or you know, hang out with meeting people for the first time, how quickly or how easily could people identify or tell that you're, you're a designer, that you dress differently? Um, I don't, I guess I have a vibe over me, but I guess my haircut is atometric as well. Uh, I think that maybe that's the first thing, sunglasses and what I'm wearing, uh, I guess, and the combination. I always wear sneakers, uh, always sneakers. Doesn't matter on the weather, always sneak. I selfishly, I have a question because I've I've always wanted to design my own clothes. And I, I'm not alone in this. Many women and men do. Yeah. And um, to be honest, I watched some YouTube videos and I watched some of my friends go through design school. And I, I came to realize that we underestimate the amount of work and the amount of knowledge that goes into designing a piece of clothing that's perhaps not just a t-shirt or a tube dress. But um, so if somebody like myself want to start doing that, like what would you recommend uh, that I kind of get my hands and feet dirty in designing my own clothes? I don't know. I, I don't think you should be afraid of it. Uh, buy some fabric, put it on you, put some pins and try to hand sew here and there, see if that sticks. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess, you know, or sew tubes, like I started out with, it's very easy and you can make some fun looks out of it. You can even make a dress, I guess for, you know, the, if you want, if we want to do it as a hobby, you know, uh, you can buy those, uh, commercial patterns Mm -hmm. and buy some fabric you like, and, you know, try to, to sew it and start with something very simple and see if it's for you or not. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's how, you know, when I got more serious about it, that's how I started out. And um, now, as you know, I, you know, have a base of pattern, of course, but uh, most of my patterns start with a square. So um, I create my own. Wow. I mean, you could do that too, if you wanted, you know, it's just two holes in a piece of fabric and this pin. Super fun. No, I have to do it. I really, I really have to. Um, if people want to find you, I think you mentioned malaikanewyork.com. Uh, what about on social media? Where would you like people to follow you there? Instagram at um, malaika. It's M-A-L-A-I-K-A. And then it's underscore new underscore York. Nice. Awesome. This is super fun. I am so happy to just to see independent fashion designers like yourself and choosing a path that you are comfortable and you're proud of instead of following, you know, what's said to be the most successful designer and purely driven on revenue and the number of stores. But I think you really found your tribe of people who, you know, love your clothes, including myself. So thank you. I actually have to, I have one thing to mention. Um, If there's anyone that's listening who want to have their own brand and they, or thinking about going into fashion school and so on, um, I would say, uh, you know, go to school, figure out if it's for you, of course, figure out what part of it you like. If you only want to design, don't have your own business unless you have tons of money to hire people to do everything for you. Uh, Because designing, if you have your own company, is like 3%. The rest is all hardcore business. and I feel like having a past uh, in logistics, knowing how a company runs, doing sales and all of this had helped me greatly. And have I not had that, I don't think I would still be in business, to be honest. So for anyone that's listening, you know, 
that's an advice I would give. Oh, thank you so much because I there are so many people listening to these podcasts or are actually looking to see, oh, how can I do what you do? And you just reminded me your 10 years veteran in logistics probably helped you with the business side of the design and your brand. Is that? Yeah, it did. It did. I mean, I know I knew how a company worked before I um, got into this. So I had an idea of what it would look like. I didn't know exactly how it was with fashion, but of course you have to create some products. Um, but it helped me greatly. Um, I was also doing sales before and, you know, also just knowing how to handle customers. I was doing sales at one point and, you know, just meeting people and, and going out there and all of that, um, creating network. Um, it, it's so important. It's everything for a small business. I'm going to add a question. What is your favorite and least favorite part of what you do? Because there's so much involved. My least favorite? I don't know if I have a least favorite thing because it's all a whole. And I guess, well, I guess my most, the thing that I love the most is when I get compliments for from customers, from pieces that I created. Because that is, uh, you know, confirmation that I actually did something that, I made something people loved. Yeah. I yeah, think that's that's, that's it. Yeah. I can I can imagine that. And it's a there there's an emotional bond. All right. So there when somebody is yeah. wearing your piece, feeling confident. I mean, feeling confident. That's as high as high as it gets. I was thinking just comfortable, you know. One of the reasons why when I put on your piece, I felt good is because like I felt like I was myself. Exactly. I wasn't trying to be anybody else. Like I, I felt like, wow, I'm looking at the best version of myself. Like this is, this is only my appearance. So this is only my, the visual, but before people get to know who I am, but I think it delivers a message as well. Yeah. I actually had a point in my life where like I had no style. I didn't know, like I was trying to follow trend after trend and after trend. And when you do that, you don't really have a style. You just follow whatever everyone else is wearing. Right. I'm just trying to help people that might not have, they have a style, but they're not sure what it is. And then I'm trying to just have a piece that makes them feel like get the style that they want. Yeah. So they can wear, you know, something they think is great and it looks good, but it doesn't look fashionable. If you know what I'm trying to. Yeah. Fast fashion. Yeah. Yeah it's so dominating and it's really hard to stay away from them. Right. So, uh, I think you're in a way you're changing people's mindsets in, in terms of how to approach fashion. And that's fascinating because with the snaps and, and different, um, just the way the clothes is constructed, you can really make it look so many different ways. Um, yeah. So you can always change it up. You don't have to buy a new piece all the time. You don't have to buy florals. You don't have to buy certain colors. You just have your staple pieces. And of course, if you do want to buy a piece, just put it together with that and you know you're good. Thank you so much. I really, what a, what a lovely uh, conversation. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, so nice meeting you. Yeah, likewise. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Bye. Hi there, it's me again. I want to thank you very much for listening to this episode, and I hope you were able to learn a few things. If you enjoyed what you heard, it will be hugely helpful if you could subscribe to the Phase Royal podcast. It literally takes seconds. If you're on your mobile phone, just search for Phase Royal podcast in the podcast app on iPhone or an Android app such as Podcast Addict and click subscribe. All new episodes will be delivered to you automatically. Thanks so much for your support.